Good morning, Gateway Church. Let's stand and worship. Let's sing. Though tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I lift my eyes. Gateway, glad you're here, ready to worship. To let us know that you are with us today, if you would, please take a moment and fill out one of our many connection card options. For example, this good old modern QR code and your smartphone, or you can still use these old school guys. No, these old school guys. And if you're streaming us today, just say something in your platform's comment section. And now, on with this week's announcements. Here we are at the last Sunday of the month. If you happen to have a birthday or anniversary in June, then we want to celebrate you today. Be sure to stop by the birthday anniversary table we've got set up back in the back of the sanctuary and pick up your small gift to honor your special time. And if you have not given us your birthday or anniversary information, if you wouldn't mind, 
please take a moment and put that on one of our many connection card options. And that way we can celebrate you when the time comes. We're still trying to get our congregation records up to date. If you wouldn't mind, please take some time and make sure we have all of your vital statistics, especially for our new members. We're looking specifically for address, uh, telephone, and email. And for our current members, if any of those stats have changed, we'd love to have those updates. We would even love to have your anniversary and birth dates if you are comfortable with giving that to us. Just put any new or updated information on any of our connection card options and we'll get the records up to date. Uh, Houston, Gateway has a problem. Jim Lovell here from Apollo 13. No, it's not our serious problem that we're having up here. It's a good problem they're having down there. Seems their nursery is growing and even overflowing, and that means that they could use some more nursery workers. If you love children, if you love Jesus, if you love to teach children about Jesus and give their parents a chance to worship without distractions, then they want you to join their child care team. So, if you'd be interested in helping them with the nursery, just write nursery on the back of your connection card or simply send an email to the office at info at mygatewaychurch.tv. Tell them Jim sent you. Okay, I need to get down to the lunar module before our batteries run out. cool things about summer is that with half the congregation gone every week, those of you who are here today don't know that that was last week's announcements. You completely, you completely didn't know that was last week's announcements. But those of you who were here last week are like, what's that? But that's only like five of you. Um, one thing that was missed because we played the wrong announcement video is that today, if you have a birthday or anniversary in the month of June, today's your day. Uh, we have a table set up at the back of the welcome center over, or the back of the sanctuary over here. And if you got a birthday or anniversary in June, if you will stop back there, we've got a little gift for you just to tell you how much we appreciate you. Now, all of that out of the way, good morning, glad you're here, glad you could join us today. Uh, one of the things I love about worship on a Sunday is in the middle of a crazy busy week, and we're not supposed to live crazy busy lives, but we're Americans, so most of us do, and in the middle of it, you can press pause and you can come in here and be with other followers of Jesus, and you can pray, you can worship, you can study the Word of God. So my, my challenge to you this morning is this. Whatever's going on in your life right now, however busy or crazy or hectic it might be or stressful, would you for the next hour just press pause and enjoy being in the presence of God? We're going to sing some songs, we're going to worship, we're going to study Scripture. And so take some time this morning and just let yourself be refreshed. I'm going to invite you to stand up. I'm going to offer a word of prayer, and then Pastor Mark and the band are going to lead us in some more worship before we get into Scripture. Father, we come to you this morning, and we are so grateful for your grace. And the, the amazing thing about grace is it's not what we deserve. It's just because you love us that you give it to us. And even though we make our lives busier than we should, even though we get stressed and hectic and we cram our, our schedules and our, our calendars and our checkbooks and our lives so full of stuff that we can't even think straight. Because you love us and in spite of the fact that all of our stress is often self-inflicted, you invite us to come sit at the foot of the cross and to pause, to sit in your presence and to be refreshed and renewed and refilled by you. And so my prayer this morning is this, that your presence would settle in this place. We would sense the presence of the Holy Spirit, that we would be still and know that you are God, that you would speak to us today. And that we would find ourselves refreshed and restored and renewed because we have been in the presence of the living God. Be with us this morning, we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank 
God that never fails will not fail me now. He won't fail me now. The waiting, the same God who's never late, is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Sing it out, you come from heaven strong. I 
Father, the lyrics of that song tell an incredible story. They speak of the God who loved us so much that he became one of us. But you didn't just become one of us, you became sin for us on the cross. And when you died on the cross, you set us free from the power of sin. You set us free from in eternity separated from you. And you offer us life through your resurrection. And so I pray that this morning we would not let that thought escape our minds, that you came to give us a life we could know, have in no other way, to save us from ourselves, to save us from sin, to save us from the mess we make. Not because we deserve it, but simply because we needed it and you love us. God, help us to keep that truth firmly in our minds as we look at Scripture today, as we open your word and, and we look at the power of connecting with others so that others can connect with you. And the whole reason for that is this new life that you gave us through the cross. So speak to us today and help us be aware of, of what you're calling us to and why. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Again, it's great to have you with us this morning. Uh, as we continue the teaching series we started last week called uh, Compelling Portrait, by the way, just a reminder, we do have study guides available. So if you're one of our small groups that meet, that study the, the sermon every week, you've got these. But if you're not in one of those groups, but you want a study guide, we have these available out here at the Welcome Center. So if you want to study this on your own or with friends, family, whatever, those are always available. Uh, we're in week two of a teaching series called Compelling Portrait. And what we're doing in this series is we're going to spend the rest of the summer. This is a 12 week long series. We're going to spend the rest of the summer looking at snapshots of the life of Jesus from Scripture. And when all those snapshots are brought together, we have this compelling portrait of Jesus. Now, a compelling portrait is a picture that makes you pause and ask questions. It's a picture that, that kind of draws you in. And last week we used some illustrations of what some of those are like. There are pictures that you've seen in the media uh, that make you want to know what's, what's going on with that picture. So what we're doing in this series is trying to create a picture of Jesus that's compelling. And when I talk about a picture of Jesus, I'm not talking about how tall he was and, and what color his hair was. Was it a long beard, a short beard, brown hair, blue eye? We don't know. Uh, I mean, you, we had a pretty good idea since he was a Jewish man born in the first century in Israel of roughly what he looked like. And it's nothing like what most of our pictures of Jesus look like. But that doesn't really matter. What we're looking at is what Jesus looked like as the Son of God, as a man living among us. And the reason that matters isn't just to satisfy our curiosity. 
tragedy. The reason it matters is this, and if you're taking notes, write this down. When I see what Jesus looked like, I see what I'm supposed to look like. When I see what Jesus looked like, I see what I'm supposed to look like. When I look at the life of Jesus, when I see the way he lived, the way he treated people, the way he interacted with his world, I see a picture of how I'm supposed to treat people, how I'm supposed to respond to God, how I'm supposed to interact with my world. Because we are called to be followers of Jesus. So this whole series hopefully is going to paint a portrait of the Jesus we love, we worship, we serve, and how we can model our lives after him. That's the whole point of this series. Now we started last week with an interesting story from the childhood of Jesus. In fact, it's the only story from the childhood of Jesus. His parents lose him uh, in the temple. Uh, can you imagine, again, we talked about this last week, can you imagine Mary and Joseph, they get that day, day away and they look at each other like, where's Jesus? Well, I thought he was with you. No, I thought he was with you. And they're like, you lost the son of God. Uh, that's kind of how it's, you know, and they have to go back. They find him, uh, and, and he humbly submits to his parents. We talked about this idea of humble submission, uh, and we said when we humbly submit, we honor others, or we bless others, and we honor Jesus. And we're going to go a little bit different direction today, but that's going to be the foundation. This idea of humble submission will play in to where we're going this morning. Grab a Bible. You're going to need it. Open your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 is where we're going to be today. If you didn't bring a Bible, there are house Bibles that are under the chairs. Feel free to open the house Bible to page 658, page 658 in the house Bible. Uh, if you don't have a good Bible at home, take the house Bible when you go. No questions asked. Again, all the text will be on the screen. No taking guide. If you use the mobile app, super, super easy to track along. Now, while you're finding Matthew 3, let me ask a question. How many of you have ever had somebody tell you a story... And to them, the story was very meaningful. Maybe to them it was funny, or maybe it was an emotional story. But it was a story that meant something to them. And about halfway through the story, you're like, okay. And when they get to the end of the story, you're like, you don't say this, but you're thinking, okay, nice, nice story. I don't get it. You ever have somebody tell you, and it meant a lot to them, but to you, you're like, hmm. I just didn't connect. There was nothing in that story that, that triggered, you know, something for me. Maybe they saw a movie and they tell you how awesome that movie is. And you went and saw the movie and you're like, I don't relate. I don't get it. Um, husbands and wives, maybe you've had some of these conversations before where, where one of you is telling the story and the other one's like, mm, nice. You just didn't get it because there was nothing in there that you connected with. Because we do better when we connect, Right. Or maybe you went to meet somebody. Maybe it was a blind date. You met somebody online. Or maybe it was a business meeting or you're at a conference and, and you sit down at a table with somebody and about five minutes into the conversation you realize, we have nothing in common. Like not at all. They're all into science fiction and I'm not at all. Or, or maybe they like hair metal, which is really the best music, and, and you're not at all. Or I'm a child from the 80s. I can't help it. Maybe they're a Dallas Cowboy fan. And there's like three of us in the room. And, and, and so the three of us, we connect, but everybody else doesn't get it. You ever have that? You meet with somebody like, there's just no connection here. They're not a bad person. You don't dislike them. But you know that outside of this particular moment or this event, you would probably not be friends. Not because they're bad, but you just don't have any connecting points with them. We struggle to connect with people sometimes. Um, and not because they're bad or we're bad. It's just there's nothing in common. Now, this is the struggle, in my opinion, this is the struggle of the church in the last half of the 20th century and so far in the 21st century. We as churches in America struggle to connect with the world around us. And, and this was illustrated painfully and beautifully for me at my first church. I'd been there just a few years. This is almost uh, 25, 30 years ago. And we were having a board meeting. We were a small church, just about 15 people. Now, the building was located right in the middle of a of a residential neighborhood. We were like three blocks from the high school, um, ideally located, and we were not getting anybody from our neighborhood to come to our church. We just weren't connecting with them. And so we're having a board meeting and we're discussing how can we find ways to connect with the people in our neighborhood so we can tell them about Jesus. And one of my board members, uh, and they were not trying to be obstinate, they weren't trying to be, you know, cranky or anything. They were being 100% sincere. They said, I have a question. They said, why are we doing this? If our neighborhood would just be more like us, they would come to church here. And they were being sincere. 
If our neighborhood was more like us, they would come to church here. And I think a lot of us operate that way when it comes to connecting people to Jesus. We just think if they were more like me, then I could connect them to Jesus, right? Isn't that kind of where we go? That's not where Jesus calls us to go. We're going to look at a, a picture from the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus that points us in an entirely different direction than that. Um, Matthew chapter 3 tells the story of Jesus getting baptized. Now, before we go any further, I'm going to set the stage for this. Um, First of all, the story starts with John the Baptist. He's preaching. And John, if you don't know, John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. They were actually cousins. Uh, John the Baptist had a very specific role. He was called by God before he was even born. We read the story in the Gospels that he was called by God to prepare the way for Jesus. He was to set the table. He was to get the hearts and the minds of the people of Israel ready to hear from Jesus, the Messiah. John was a bit odd. Um, he lived out in the wilderness. It says he ate locust and honey, so he, has, he ate bugs and honey. Um, so he was like the first vegan ever. Um, he, uh, except that he wore camel hair uh, for a vest, so maybe not so vegan. But he was an odd duck. If you've watched The Chosen, they refer to him as Creepy John. Yeah, there's a reason. He was kind of an odd Uh, dude. He was a member of a group called the Essenes, and the Essenes believed that they should just isolate themselves from the world. But John comes out of that group to tell people about the coming Messiah. And John is preaching repentance. Now, repentance uh, is a very churchy word. Uh, We get a little hung up on it. All it means is to change, just to turn around. And he's telling the people of Israel, stop living sinful lives and start obeying God. And he's calling people to be baptized for this. Now, something else you need to know uh, about baptism is this. John's baptism is what we call repentance baptism. John was saying, change your life, and to signify this new life change, come get baptized. It's a symbol of a new life. So as, as Christians, when we do baptism here at church, if somebody gets baptized, we did baptisms uh, just at Easter a couple months ago. Uh, it's this symbolic, you go under the water, one person, you come out a different person. So there's several symbols taking place there. There's death, and resurrection. The old person died, the new person has come to life. There's the symbol of washing away your sins. This this whole idea of new life when it comes to baptism. And that's the repentance baptism John was preaching, but that's not the only kind of baptism that was going on. Uh, In fact, baptism isn't unique to Christians. Baptism takes place in a lot of religions and a lot of cultures. In Jewish culture, uh, people get baptized all the time. Uh, In fact, over and over again, when we were in Israel uh, just a few weeks ago, our tour guy was a a Jewish man. Every morning he went out and and practiced what's called mikvah, where you you basically baptized yourself. And he seven times dipped himself in the water as an act of baptism to start every day. Okay? Um, and a mikvah is, is both the act and the location of baptism. So in Jewish baptism, this mikvah is this, they would usually build a stone thing, kind of like a baptistry. But in Jewish tradition, it has to be living water. In other words, the water has to be flowing in and flowing out. So you can use a lake if there's a river flowing in and a river flowing out. You can't use the ocean. Make sense? Because there's water flowing in but not flowing out. Um, you can use a river. It's flowing water. But what they would do was in almost every synagogue, they would build a mikvah, which is a place where you could take seven steps down in to get baptized. And then they would have water poured in at the top and it would trickle in and then have a little bit of it trickling out so that it was technically it was living water. And they would baptize themselves like that. And so if you were ceremonially unclean, but you wanted to worship God, you would baptize yourself or go get baptized so you could go to the temple and worship. It was just almost like if you were a Jewish man and and you'd had a family member die and you'd been a part of the the ceremony, now you're ceremonially unclean. You have to be baptized before you can go in and worship God. Okay, so if you were unclean, you had to baptize yourself to go worship God. But there was another aspect of baptism that dealt with identity. If you were not Jewish, but you had converted to Judaism. Before you could become a full-on Jew, you had to be baptized to be, go under the water and come back up to identify with this new community, this new family. Very much like Christian baptism. You're identifying with a new group of people. John is, is baptizing people in the name of repentance. They're getting saved, if you will. They're, they're, they're saying, I'm going to follow God's way, not my way. They're being baptized to indicate this new life. And Jesus comes on the scene. And here's what happens. Matthew 13, or 3, starting in verse 13. 
Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and, the, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So John's baptizing in the name of repentance. Decide to follow this new life. Decide to follow God. Get baptized. And Jesus walks up and goes, Hey, I want you to baptize me. And you can almost hear the silence fall. Because John knows who Jesus is. He doesn't fully understand the Messiahship, and he has some questions about that later. But John knows who Jesus is. And Jesus walks up to John and goes, I want you to baptize me. And John's like, hold on. Aren't you the Son of God? Shouldn't I be getting baptized by you? You don't need to repent, Jesus. You don't have sin in your life. You don't need to, to repent and become a new person and be baptized. Why in the world does Jesus show up to be baptized if he doesn't have sin in his life? Why does Jesus show up to be baptized if he doesn't need to repent? Why in the world is Jesus showing up? And so John is rightfully confused, and Jesus replies, look, this is the right thing to do to fulfill all righteousness. What is Jesus talking about here? So let me see if I can explain it a little bit. First of all, correct, Jesus doesn't need to be baptized. He's not sinful. He doesn't have a sinful life to repent of, okay? But if he is going to lead a new movement, if he's going to teach people, if he's going to connect with people, he has to be able to identify with them. So when Jesus gets baptized, he doesn't get baptized because he's sinful and needs to repent. He gets baptized because everybody else is sinful and needs to repent. And his baptism is, a, baptism is a way of identifying with them. It's a way of him connecting with them. It's a way of him going, I'm in this with you. I'm here with you. I've come to be among you. Not only that, if he's going to lead a movement, People got to know, all right, he's, he's, you know, he's doing things the right way. So this baptism is, uh, look, he's crossing the T's, dotting the I's. He's getting it right. But at the end of the day, the real reason here is Jesus is choosing to connect with sinful people. All the people in those crowds, they absolutely needed to be baptized. Just like you and I needed to be baptized, right? We need to repent from our sinful lives, become new people. Jesus says, well, I don't need that. I do want to connect with you. And so he steps into the place all the rest of us are to connect with us. Connecting with other people is so important. In fact, here's how important it is. If you're taking notes, write this down. I need to connect with others in order to connect others with Jesus. Just like Jesus identified with the crowds around him, we have to learn to identify or to connect with the crowds around us so that we connect those people to Jesus. Now, real quick, sidebar. I'm not saying you need to make other people your projects. Nobody wants to be your project. I don't want to be your project. You don't want to be my project. You don't make friends with the next door neighbor just to invite them to church, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. But we learn to connect with people and do life with people and engage in life with people and love on people and experience life with other people so that through our lives we can help point them to Jesus. Just like Jesus was baptized to connect with us, we have to learn how to connect with other people. Remember last week we talked about the word Christian? We said the word Christian means little Christ. The first followers of Jesus are called Christians, not as an insult or as a, as a compliment, it's just as a description. You are a little Christ, you act like Jesus. If I'm going to call myself a Christian, then I have to be willing and able to connect with other people. I don't get to call myself Christian and isolate myself from the world around me. I don't get to call myself Christian and hide in, a, in my little Christian hidey hole and lob scripture grenades at the world around me. I have to be able to connect with the world around me. And I think for far too long, the church has done this. The church has looked at the world out there and gone, oh, the world is big, bad, and evil. Okay, fair enough. But then what we do is we withdraw into our own little encampment. And if you grew up in Christian culture like I did in the 1980s, then, then you know what I'm talking about. We pull away and to make our own little Christian subculture, our own little Christian ghetto, and we have Christian music, 
And we have our own Christian t-shirts. And we actually have Christian stores that we can buy our things from. And we do Christian this and, and we all have this own Christian. We have our own Christian lingo. And if you were a, a kid in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, you know what I'm talking about. We lived in this little Christian subculture. And every now and again, we would step out into the rest of the world, look at how bad it was, and go, you all need Jesus. And then we would hide back over here in our little Christian subculture. Did anybody grow up in a world like that? Anybody have that? Because that was the reality I grew up in. And it was a little bit odd because we had this Christian subculture that was really good at looking over the wall at the rest of the world and going, man, they're terrible. That world's awful. Man, I'm so glad that we have Jesus. And we isolated ourselves from the world. And Jesus goes, you don't get to do that. If you're going to follow me, you don't get to do that. We have to go out of our little hidey hole and live in the world out here but different from the world out here. And again, we have to learn how to connect with others so we can connect into Jesus. Now, I immediately know what the pushback is. I know it because I used to make the same pushback. I know it because this is a very common pushback. If we get out there and live like the world, aren't we just compromising? Aren't we just being like the world, you know? Isn't that what we're going on? So let me kind of unpack just briefly what connecting or identifying with our world is not so we can understand what it is. If you're taking notes, here's the first one. Identifying with my culture does not mean approving of my culture. It's possible to identify with, to connect with our culture, but not approve of our culture. So the culture Jesus lived in. It's a very interesting culture, and we often miss it, but if you study uh, the history of Israel in the first century, you discover that you had some religious groups that were super liberal, and you couldn't tell that they were religious groups at all, and you had other religious groups that were super conservative, and they hated everybody else, and you had some religious groups that were interested in getting political power and leverage so that they could, they could make changes in their culture. And you had some groups that were wealthy that, that said, well, we're wealthy because God loves us. And you had other groups that weren't wealthy, well, we're poor because we love God. Um, and, you, and I'm not describing America right now. I'm describing first century Israel. But it sure sounds familiar, doesn't it? This is the culture Jesus lived in. And Jesus connected with this culture without approving of this culture. John is out there teaching and preaching repentance. Look at Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. John is speaking to his culture and saying, that might be the culture, and you have to live there, but you don't have to be like it. So we're not approving of the culture. As Christians in the world today, we don't get to approve of everything going on in our culture. And there's a lot that goes on in our culture that we should not be approving of. Right? There's a lot going on in the world out there that we as Christians can't embrace. We have to live in the culture, but we don't have to embrace the culture. We can connect with the culture without embracing the culture. And there are things that we should stand against. And when I say stand against, I don't necessarily mean put up a sign and stand on the street corner and, and, and hate everybody who disagrees with you, but we live lives that are different than the world around us. And we engage those people. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we live different lives in the middle of our culture. So we learn to connect with our culture, but we don't approve it. Here's the second thing identifying with your culture is not. If you're taking notes, write this down. Identifying with my culture does not mean adopting my culture. It does not mean adopting my culture. A part of the pushback that we have on the whole connect with my culture thing is legitimate because there are some churches that have gone all in on the culture and you can't tell the church from the culture. You can't tell where culture ends and church begins. In an effort to be accommodating and in an effort to, to, to be affirming of everyone, and if you think you know what I'm talking about, you may be surprised at what I'm actually thinking of right now because it's probably not what you think I'm thinking of. Uh, it, we we want to embrace everybody and say, hey, everybody's okay. If everybody's okay, we don't need the cross. We want to say that everything's okay. So we can't adopt our culture and be just like our culture to win our culture. Okay? Look what Peter says, First Peter chapter 2. He says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires 
which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Peter calls followers of Jesus foreigners and exiles in our world. You live in this world. You live in this culture. You identify with culture. You, you, you understand your culture, but you don't adopt your culture. Which, by the way, this is really hard to do. It's really, really hard to do. It's really hard to live in the world and not be like the world. Because our natural tendency is to want to get along with people. Our natural tendency is to want to, want to engage everybody out there at their level. And, and that's okay, but it's not okay to, be, to go to that level. Does that, does that make sense? So we don't get to uh, approve the culture. We don't get to adopt the culture. Here's how we do this. If you're taking notes, write this down. Here's what identifying my culture does mean. And the first thing is this. It means engaging my culture. Now, let me spend a few minutes unpacking this idea of engaging culture. Engaging culture means I get out of my little hidey hole. I get out of my safe space. I get out of all the people who think like me and act like me and believe like me. And I come out here and I engage the world. Because we're really good at this. And by the way, this isn't just a Christian thing. This is just, I think, current reality and American thing. We're very good at, at echo chambers. We're very good at isolating ourselves. We're very good at, at surrounding ourselves with people who think like we do and believe like we do and want what we want. If you don't think that's true, go read the social media feeds after the debate the other night. Right? There are two very clear camps. Right? And we're real good at surrounding ourselves with people who think like us and say the same things we say, so it just it reinforces what we're thinking, right? But as, if we're going to engage our culture, we've got to get out of here and walk out here and engage with people who have a different system of values than we have, who have a different view of the world than we have, who don't believe what we believe about Jesus, who don't believe what we believe politically, who don't believe what we believe about a whole lot of things. We leave our little safe space and come out here and we engage them. I'm not saying that, that we will agree with it, them, okay? But we engage them. And we do so in an appropriate way. We have lost the art of agreeing or disagreeing agreeably, right? Don't we all want to fight all the time? And it's kind of fun to watch, but you don't really want to be a part of it. You watch the sparks fly as people crash into each other, and my idea, and I can't be your friend anymore. I'm going to unfriend you on whatever social media platform because you believe something different than I do, whether it's religiously or politically or whatever. As followers of Jesus, we don't have that option. As followers of Jesus, we have to leave our little safe space of everybody who thinks like we think, and we have to go out here, and we have to make friends with, and we have to work with, and we have to live next door, live, live next door to, and engage intelligently and lovingly people who don't agree with us. People who are nothing like Jesus really like Jesus. And we need to figure out, church, how to take people who are nothing like us and help them like us, not for us, but so that we can point them to Jesus. I need to connect with others so I can connect others with Jesus. So church, we need to learn how to connect with our culture, engage with people who don't agree with what we agree with. And the way you do that is the next thing. If you're taking notes, shut this down. That means I got to understand my culture. It means I have to understand. And I can't understand my culture if I keep isolating myself from it, which means I need to actually spend time studying my culture. At the risk of offending everybody in the room, we're lazy. We don't want to study our culture. We listen to a few things we agree with and we call it good. What we need to do is study our culture. We need to read books. People still do that. Um, or listen to them. I prefer to read, but lately I've been listening because I'm busy. Uh, we need to read books or listen to books. We need to read, or I mean, we need to listen to podcasts that explore culture from a Christian perspective. We need to listen to podcasts to people who disagree with us and, and their view of culture. We need to understand what makes our culture tick. Because I think we often think we do, but because we isolate ourselves, we don't really know. 
We need to be willing to sit down and have coffee with somebody on the other side of the spectrum from us and, and say, teach me about this. Tell me what you believe. One of the really cool things about our trip to Israel is that our tour guide uh, was a Jewish man who was not, not a Christian, Jewish. But he was so open. And we would sit at lunch and I would say, hey, Yoav, tell me about your faith. You know, I know I'm a Christian and I study the Bible and I study all kinds of stuff. But here's a man who lives it. Tell me about your faith. Tell me, tell me what I don't understand. And have those conversations with people. Go have conversations with your friends who don't believe what you believe. Study your culture. Read up on your culture. Listen to things. Watch things. I'm not saying you have to buy all of it. I'm just saying learn, study. And I think far too often in church, we have been guilty of being lazy. We're like, well, I know what I believe, and I, you know, I don't want you to confuse me with the truth. I, I, I'm right here, and, and I'm comfortable. But Jesus didn't call us to be comfortable. He called us to get out and engage. And to engage, we have to understand and then here's the third thing we got to do. If we're going to actually identify with our culture, we have to love and serve the people in our culture. We love and serve the people in our culture. Now, I don't mean we help people do things that are destructive to them. Okay? I don't mean we, we, we help them do things that aren't good for them and others. But we do love and serve people. And we love and serve people without an agenda attached to it. I'm going to love and serve you so you'll come to my church. I'm going to love and serve you so you'll believe what I believe. I'm going to love and serve you as long as it, right? No, we just love and serve people. When you look at the ministry of Jesus, Jesus didn't go, oh, yeah, you're, I'll, I'll serve you because you're, you're a good Jewish young man, but not you because you're, didn't, he didn't do that. When there was a need, Jesus saw the need, Jesus met the need. What if we learn to just love and serve people, even people we disagree with, even people who hate us, we love them and we serve them. You want to identify with your culture, just like Jesus identified with his culture. You got to quit hiding in our little hidey hole. We got to quit surrounding ourselves with only people who think, act, believe like us. We got to quit reading only things we agree with. We have to learn to get into our world, engage it, understand it, and love and serve the people in our culture. And maybe, maybe I'm just overly simplistic in my thinking here, but I'm convinced, church, that if we could do this, well, there's what, 70 of us in here today? If the 70 of us in here today had just started doing this, a year from now, the, the, the fabric of our very county would be different. And there would be more people here learning to do this, and it would change. It would spread. It, because when we love and serve people, when we, when we engage them where they are without adopting the culture around us, that becomes contagious. Jesus came and was baptized, not because he needed to repent, but because he was connecting with sinful people. And if we're going to be followers of Jesus, we have to do the same thing. So what's the takeaway on this one this morning? What, what do we do with this one? Pastor Mark, if you and the band want to come on up. Here's my challenge to you this morning. Challenge number one, spend some time asking yourself the question, do I, do I isolate? Do I hide myself? Do I stay only where I'm comfortable? Or do I get out and engage my world? And some of you I know really well. Some of you are engaging your world, your workplaces, your neighbors in an amazing way, and it's awesome. Some of us, we don't do it so well. So ask yourself, am I actually connecting with and engaging the culture around me? Not, a, not approving of it, not, you know, not endorsing it, not adopting it, but do, am I engaging the people around me? And if you're not, here's what I would invite you to do. Start praying, God, who? Who do you want me to connect with? Who do you want me to, to is it the neighbor across the street? Is it the new guy that bought the house next door? Is it the coworker at the other end of the cubicle down there that, that I don't get, but, you know, whatever? Who do you want me to connect with? And then, and here comes the hardest part of the whole thing. Pray for strength, because I will tell you right now, this may be one of the hardest things we do. It's really, really hard to wade into our culture and engage our culture and not get sucked into our culture. We need the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit 
to live like Jesus in the middle of a culture that doesn't get Jesus and do so in a way that's winsome and inviting without selling our values down the river. It's really hard. And so if we're going to do any of it, we got to start by praying, God, give me the strength. Give me, give me the Holy Spirit to live out your way in the middle of a world that doesn't get it. And there will be days when you can come home and tell stories like, man, it's so cool. This guy at work, he, he's, he's curious. He's got questions. And there will be days when you come home and go, oh, I think I screwed this up so bad. But if we surrender ourselves to let the Holy Spirit work through us, he will keep working through our good days and our bad days. He'll help us get it right when we get it wrong. He'll keep us humble. He'll help us know how to engage. Jesus didn't need to repent. He was baptized to identify with us. And he calls us to go and identify with our culture in a way that loves them without endorsing what's going on in the world around us. And maybe this felt a little vague today. Maybe this seemed a little, I'm not sure how to grasp it. I mean, I hope I was clear. If I wasn't, here's my prayer. God, help people understand what I'm trying to say. So here's how we're going to close. We're going to take communion like we do almost every week. If you choose to take communion this morning, as Pastor Mark and the band play, in that moment, would you pause and say, all right, Jesus, I really want to live for you in my world. I can't keep hiding. I want to get out and live for you in my world. Help me to do it in a way that honors you, but at the same time loves others. Help me to connect with others so I can connect others to Jesus. Let me pray. The band's going to play quietly. You're free to take communion if you want to. And then after that, they're going to wrap up with some time of worship. Father, we love you. And I'll acknowledge I struggle. I kind of flip-flop between isolate myself or, or just go all in with culture in an effort to, to show you to people. But you didn't do either of those. You were the sinless son of God who lived in a sinful and corrupt culture, but you did so in a way that drew people to you. Your life was so attractive. What you offered was so different and so unique. And it's easy for us to, to read Scripture, look back and go, well, yeah, but that's how Jesus did it. But that's how you called us to do it. And you didn't just call us to do that, but you have promised that you would empower us to do that. And so I pray for those of us who, who have this tendency to hide and to isolate ourselves, that you would help us to, to break out of that and, and engage the world around us. And Lord, for those of us who, who tend to run headlong into culture without holding you up and honoring you, God, you would, you would kind of slam the brakes on for us. And you would help all of us learn how to step out of our comfort zone, to do life with the people around us in a way that points them to you and your love and your grace and your mercy and calls them to a new life. Help us to be the right representation of you that our world needs. We ask this in your name. Amen.
You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. Oh, the sin and sing. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things still to be done in this city. God, we love you. We thank you for the promise that that song sings. That you are more than just what we think is going on. That you're more than our imagination can fathom, God. That you see further. That you see beyond, God, because you are the artist. You're the painter. You painted the picture, God. You know exactly what's going to happen in our lives. So I just pray that we can trust you in this moment. That we can engage our community, God others for you, that we can see them as brothers and sisters, God, that we can go out, out of our comfort zones, out of the fear that we tend to hide, God, and engage in love. God, keep our hearts strong and pure. 
And God, as we love others, God, I pray that you plant a seed, God, that grows from only you. We love you, God, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Once again, it's great to have you guys with us today. When you go out this week, look for ways to connect with people that maybe you haven't even thought of before and pray that God would help you know how to connect. Um, Pastor Mark, I'm going to have you lead us in one last song, and then we're going to call it a day. Don't forget, if you have a birthday or anniversary in June, stop at the table back here. We have a gift for you. Have a great day.